Advisors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me to your annual event here in Bali. Um, perhaps you wonder where is the University of Asia and the Pacific? There is a University of Asia Pacific which is based in Bangladesh, but we are not that university. We are a development think tank, a research university that is based in the Philippines. Our strength really lies in the fact that we have a very strong business network which allows us to conduct researches and activities that could help decision makers both in the public and the private sectors. Last year, we were able to organize a number of activities that may be related to trade, investment, and the rule of law. The first of that activity was the holding of a roundtable on the Philippine National Action Plan for Business and Human Rights. The second was the publication of a guidebook and implementation strategies for incorporating CSR in small and medium enterprises. And the third one, which is a very exciting publication that we have, we were commissioned by the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines to come up with a monitoring tool for economic, social, and cultural rights. Now, all of these works have led us to the observation that the impacts of business activities on human rights are material to achieving commitments in the area of sustainable development. Here, we can see the potential impacts of changes, for instance, in tariff, prices, access, agreements on human rights. But my talk will not focus on this. There is a more, far greater observation that we have derived from these impacts, and that is the balance of power that could influence sustainable development lies not with government or civil society organizations or development organizations but with big businesses and its investors. For this reason, my topic, Deconstructing Sustainable Development, it is crucial to impress upon business that adopting sustainable practices can lead to competitive advantage greater market share, and increase shareholder value. My talk will proceed from these observations. First, I will try to share what is the concept of sustainable development and sustainability, and then translate that in the context of the ASEAN, and then I will end my presentation with some practices and policy recommendations for ASEAN. Sustainable development well, it has been defined as the capacity to endure in pursuit of a common ideal. <coughs> Through the years, however, sustainability and its underlying principle of sustainability development, of sustainable development, have been largely considered to be related to environmental sustainability. This is the reason why we conducted the research where we explored the different perspectives on sustainability and we came up with this definition that sustainable development is the careful and efficient stewardship of resources to deliver desired outcomes in ways that respect the future generations and restorative of natural, cultural, and financial assets. But the main contribution of our research in sustainable development is in shifting the attention in discussions about sustainability from the macro environment to the individual human person who should be at the center of sustainable development. There can be no sustainable development without integral human development. That's the three pillars, the triple bottom line, profit, planet, and people. At the core of that is integral development of the human person. 
With the onset of the UN Millennium Goals and recently the Social Development Goals, two more areas have been added to the triple bottom line. And these areas are the areas of prosperity and peace. But whatever the pillars, the bottom line is that aside from the integral development of the human person, for development to be sustainable, it must be in the context of limits and boundaries. <coughs> Key takeaway. What is really cool about sustainable development is that big business or companies also embrace it as something that is good for business. Studies have shown that as high as 93% of CEOs today believe that sustainability is the future of their business in the sense that it drives long-term investments and creates shared value by balancing three forms of capital. Because basically, sustainability development is the management of three forms of capital, financial, natural, and human capital. If we frame our understanding of sustainable development in this manner, then we have a high chance of convincing the business community to adopt sustainable development. Likewise, sustainable development also differentiated actions between developed and developing countries, as in the case of emissions, for example, where developed countries must lead the way for reductions of emissions and support developing countries in implementing these. Sustainable development is enshrined in ASEAN Vision 2025, as can be seen in this presentation. In the vision, it states peoples enjoy human rights and fundamental freedoms, higher quality of life, and the benefits of community building. Let us deconstruct sustainable development in ASEAN, first from an economic perspective. I will not dwell on all of them because the previous speakers from yesterday and today have already discussed extensively on some of these points. But I will just allow me to emphasize, for example, that one of the economic trends in ASEAN nowadays is much of the growth in ASEAN during the last decade can be attributed to the expansion of the domestic market. Thanks in part to the opening of China and its uh, double track pricing no? versus the big bang strategy of opening uh, sudden transformation to capitalism as what was uh, um, uh, implemented in Eastern Europe and Russia. ASEAN also is assuming economic growth leadership together with the economies of China and India we form what we call a tripolar engines of growth. Food security is a economic trend in ASEAN. For, for example, rice being staple of the half 70% uh, of the world's poor consume rice. And some 90% of the world's rice supply is produced in Asia. Thailand and Vietnam are the world's largest producers and exporters of rice, whereas Indonesia and the Philippines are the world's largest consumers and importers of rice. So diabetes is a big problem. Well, another ASEAN member, Myanmar, is catching up and is reassuming its place as the world's largest exporter of rice, as in the 1950s. Singapore, of course, almost completely relies on trade for rice. This fact underlies the importance of durable regional arrangements on rice production and supply. Another economic trend in ASEAN is what we call, in economics, the middle income trap. More than 15 countries globally have been middle income for the last 20, at the last 50 years. Out of those 15, three can be found in ASEAN. These are Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand. 
they fall into the middle income trap if they are unable to move from a low cost to a high value economy. What, that, what does it take to move, therefore, from low cost to high value economy? We can look at the experience of South Korea where they invested heavily in the expansion of secondary and tertiary education, which hastened its successful transition from a low income, middle income, to a high income economy. The prospects of economic growth in ASEAN is assured for the next 20, 30 years, simply because barriers to investments and tariffs have been eliminated through the years. For instance, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, and Thailand eliminated barriers to investments and tariffs in 90% of products. The other ASEAN members followed suit in 2015. China charged on ASEAN goods would be cut to 0.1% from 9.8%. And average tariff imposed on Chinese goods by ASEAN states will fall from 0.6% from 12.8%. This economic trends triggers a number of consumer trends. I will not dwell on all of them again, only some. First, expanding middle class in Asia. In 2012, there were an estimated 190 million people in Southeast Asia that could be considered as middle class. And these are people with a disposable income of 60 to 100 US dollars a day. These are middle income people. This number, because of the steady economic growth, will more than double by 2020 to 400 million people. So from 190 million middle class to 400 million people. So no wonder that in ASEAN cities, mollification is very evident. What do I mean by mollification? Of the 10 largest malls in the world, five can be found in ASEAN. Sayang, Paragon, and Bangkok, Berjaya Times Square in Kuala Lumpur, SM Mega Mall in Manila, SM Mall of Asia in Manila, and Central World in Bangkok, mollification of Asian cities. The third consumer trend that I would like to focus on is what we call demographic winter. Well, in other parts of the world, there is a rapid aging of population. I think Singapore is experiencing that. While the rest of ASEAN is experiencing what I call demographic spring. The use of English is also expanding. Some even joke that AEC stands for ASEAN English Competency. AEC. In all of this, higher education will play a significant role. As of now, ASEAN higher education system encompasses 6,500 educational institutions with 12 million students in 10 regions. Underlying this, of course, is the ongoing digital revolution, which our colleague earlier talked about. Uh, it has a significant impact in the banking industry. But the digital revolution can also make our cities more livable, safer, and vibrant. In terms of industries, where are investments and trade going? Well, there, these are some of the industries that we have identified in ASEAN. But the majority of these would be in what we call the triple T's. Transport, telecom, tourism. And in the four F, food, because of the huge population, fashion. ASEAN fashion designers are emerging the one of the best designers in the world. 
furniture, and of course, fun. In terms of social trends, I will focus on population, poverty, transparency, and transnational terrorism. ASEAN is the third largest market in the world, and we are mostly VIPs. These are populations from Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Poverty remains a challenge, with 90% of the 36 million people in Southeast Asia are living below poverty line. Majority of them are Philippines, Filipinos, and Indonesians. The health data suggest encouraging results, but corruption remains a barrier to entry. And finally, terrorism is a major issue. Environmental trends, CO2 emissions are rising in at least five countries, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And because of this, the cost of pollution are high in ASEAN, and this will just continue in the coming years. The good news, however, is that businesses have embraced climate change. The reason varies from company to company, but executive bonuses are now linked to company sustainability performance. And the rock stars are becoming the chief financial officer of the companies. Likewise, businesses are embracing sustainability because human rights is becoming, climate change is becoming a human rights issue, as can be seen in these landmark cases filed globally. In the Philippines, there are pending climate justice cases in our Commission on Human Rights. Forested areas will continue to decline, but overall, ASEAN is stable and slowly advancing in terms of inclusive development. In terms of index, Advanced Economies IDI is 5.76, for ASEAN is 4.06. SDGs, we are progressing in SDG, as, uh, social development goals. And we, are, then, we will continue to progress simply because of the economic dynamism present in ASEAN. And finally, I would like to focus on five recommendations. Pursue green growth strategy, continue investment in human capital, <coughs> development of green infrastructure, political leadership, and good governance. This is primarily moving ASEAN from a paradigm of competitiveness to growth to being a relevant organization. Business will go along simply because the mega trends are significantly affecting business operations in ASEAN. This is a framework that we have developed to analyze the impact of mega trends on business. One is green growth strategy. Of course, we need to pursue carbon neutrality in the years to come. Second, invest heavily in human capital. There is substantial room for human capital development. And green and resilient infrastructure. Connectivity is very important because internet connection can drive innovations. I am just uh, sad about our country, the Philippines, which is at the bottom in terms of internet speed. And lastly, political leadership and good governance, which should focus on four fundamental pillars of the rule of law. One, accountability. Second, equity. Fourth, transparency. Third, and fourth, access to protecting fundamental human rights. So those are the four policy recommendations that I can identify to continue maintaining the pace of social development in ASEAN. Thank you.